Love this podcast? Support this show through the ACAST supporter feature. It's up to you how much you give, and there's no regular commitment. Just click the link in the show description to support now. You're about to enter into a new world of knowledge, curiosities, and high strangeness. This is a podcast of Straight Up Strange Productions. Tonight, the spook lights be spookin' as we talk about the Min Min lights in Bully, Australia, and the, the Hesdalen lights in, well, Hesdalen, Norway. All that and more on Small Town Secret. <laughs> Hello, everyone, and welcome to the third episode of the fifth season of Small Town Secrets. And listen, actually, it probably doesn't even matter with the music, but I have finally found and isolated the weird interference noise that has been plaguing the show since I moved the office around. Now, to most people, unless for some reason you listen to this episode, or this episode, this show on like really awesome headphones or maybe you've got it cranked in the car on a late night drive or something you probably never even hear that but for like the last i don't know eight episodes maybe there's been little noises and stuff from the router because now i'm so much closer to it but uh i have finally been able to figure out a way to isolate it and uh keep it from pipping and popping over the mic and uh, not have to just unplug it or something, you know. Uh, it's it's nice to have the internet on the entire time, uh, because what will happen is I will unplug it, forget that I've unplugged it, and then get very mad when it won't work when I go to try to upload the show until I remember that it is I who have caused such a thing. Uh, but that, just one, you know, in case of anyone has ever heard that on their speakers or in their headphones or whatever, and it's been driving them nuts, I'm sure there's, like, two of you out there that have... Uh, that it's been bugging for weeks, but it should be gone now. So if you do still hear it, uh, I have another problem, I guess, that I have to fix. But this is the third episode. This is, uh, I think it's going to be kind of a laid-back episode, uh, trying to get back on schedule from last episode and all of that. I've also, if you've noticed, this episode will come out on Sunday morning, late, late Saturday night. I've decided to... Uh, push the show back a day uh, because it's really helping out right now with getting back into the swing of things and getting back into work and uh, having an extra day, not just an extra day, but an extra day of being off and not having to do anything has really helped the last couple of episodes uh, breathe a little bit and give me some breathing room. So I'm going to rock the Sunday morning and see how it goes. Um, You know, I used to always try to keep Saturdays and stuff open for plans and whatnot, uh, but I'm too much of an introvert, and being stuck 
and a pandemic has made made me more of one. So I'm like, yeah, you know what? Uh, I could just stay in every other Saturday night and do the show. I'll figure it out. Uh, but no, I'm really digging it so far. Yes, the show will come out, but it'll give you something to do on your lazy Sunday nights or Sunday mornings whenever you listen to it. Also, that's a great thing. It's a podcast. You can listen to it whenever the hell you want to. But what are we going to get into tonight? Uh, I want to talk about spook lights tonight. Uh, Will of the Wisp, jack-o'-lanterns, many names. And there's a bunch of them that I could have chosen. I could probably do like a whole other episode on lights. Uh, spook lights, mysterious, you know, bouncing lights. Uh, and I might, but I don't know, because after a while they are kind of very, very similar. But I wanted to hit two that I think are interesting, have similarities, but are also very different. We're going to talk about the Min Min Light at, near Bully, Australia. So we're back in Australia. Second time, second show in a row with Australia. And uh, then we're going to go to Hesdalen, Norway, and talk about the Hesdalen Lights, which have a very different thing going on and are probably our best shot at actually figuring out what Spook Lights uh, spook, spook lights actually are. And if you want even more Spook Light goodness, uh, head over to Patreon, patreon.com slash stscast, or go to stscast.com and click on support, and there will be a link to it there as well, uh, where we're going to talk about uh, the Brown Mountain Lights in STS Backroads, which is the exclusive show that you get at the $5 level. So you can go and check that out if you're interested. Uh, like I said, extra, sh- or not extra shows, a, an exclusive show, which is kind of always an extension of this one most of the time. Uh, buttons and stickers and access to the music and all sorts of stuff that you can uh, check out a $1, $3, $5 level. So if if uh, you want to hear about the Brown Mountain Lights and all of the other episodes that I've already done over there, then yeah, check out the Patreon and uh, help support the show if you can. Thank you very much. Uh, but let's move on. Let's talk about, first, the Min Min Lights in Bullia, Australia. Hello, all you curious creatures out there. I'm Amber Ray. And I'm Andrew McKay. And we are the hosts of Into the Portal. If you like myths, legends, history with a paranormal twist, join us every week as we explore lesser known mysteries of our world and beyond. You can find us on iTunes, Google Play Music, and all other major podcast platforms, and at IntoThePortal.com, your gateway to the bizarre. The only question is do you dare peer into the portal? Three hundred and one people live in the tiny outback Australian town of Bullia. The town actually lies in the Shire of Bullia. It's part of Queensland, actually, and uh, it's home to a couple of things, such as the Bullia Desert Sands Camel Races, and also the strange and mysterious Min Min Light. Not lights, light. Every once in a while, there might be two, but most of the time, I think it's just people just see like one solitary light. Outside of town, a sign was once posted reading, Min Min Light, this unsolved mystery is a light that at times follows travelers for long distances. It has been approached, but never identified. Lights like this have been around Australia for almost as long as anyone can remember. But the Min Min Lights, they often appear as a white ball, or they, I keep saying, I'm gonna say it. It often appears as a, a white ball of light just above the horizon. Sometimes said to be so bright that uh, it will illuminate the ground underneath it. Aboriginals claim them to be the spirits of those who have passed, while local Aussies have been told since they were kids that the lights would get them. A local legend goes, if one of those lights catches you, you'll die. The Min Min actually appear all over the outback of Australia. Uh, And like many of these spook lights, they have different names. Will of the Wisp jack-o'-lanterns, and sometimes just referred to as the Min-Min. I believe, like, in Australia, think of it, it's, it's kind of become a catch-all term for these things. They're, we just call them, they just call them a Min-Min light, like, even if it's nowhere around the area of Bullia, you know. The Min-Min proper 
get their name from the area just outside of Bulia, a town that used to be called Min Min. And if you go there now, all you will find, besides some great scenery, is the still operating Hamilton Hotel at one end and the ruins of the Min Min Hotel at the other. William Lilly and his wife Mary Lilly started the Min Min Hotel sometime in the 1880s. As you might suspect, records taken in the outback in the late 1800s are probably a bit sketchy. Uh, it was a place for weary travelers to stop for a beer or to get some rest. Some stories have uh, painted it as a rough and tumble place that overcharged heavily for uh, their liquor and their supplies. This overcharging led to many a disagreement with the staff, and if you were unlucky enough, you may end up in an unmarked cemetery out in the back behind uh, the property. Or it may have been a quaint family-owned business that had high prices simply because it was expensive to get product delivered to such a secluded location. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to go with the latter on that. The first, you know, the first one is a great story, and I'm sure many great stories have been woven with that in mind. But uh, if you look up the grave of Lily, which is, is still around, you can read the tombstone, and it does not read like someone who uh, ran what was essentially like a, a badass biker bar. Uh, so I think it was just, oh, it was ex it's expensive because we're out in the middle of nowhere, and... There is a graveyard out there, like a cemetery with them, with some unmarked graves. And I mean, I don't know, it was the outback in the 1880s. It probably wasn't the most hospitable place. It's not the most hospitable place now. So, you know, who knows how many people just like showed up there and died of heat stroke because they were on their deathbed by the time they showed up. I don't know, but I'm sure there's much more quaint explanations to uh, the, the rough and tumble Min Min Hotel. But whatever its reputation, the Minman Hotel burned to the ground in 1917. If you visit there now, all you'll find is a couple of grave markers, one for Mary that I mentioned earlier, and one for the forgotten traveler, quote unquote, and uh, thousands of pieces of broken bottles. But even though the strange lights such as the Minman have been witnessed around the outback for hundreds of years, the Minmin Light started to gain ground a year after the hotel burnt down. As the story goes, in 1918, a stockman was making his way from station to station, checking on the livestock as he went. And a stockman was basically, he'd get on a horse, and he'd ride around the ranches, and he'd just check to make sure that, you know, nothing was out of place, that cattle or whatever were not where they were supposed to be. It was night by the time he made it to where the hotel had been. He looked over his shoulder and something caught his eye. It was a bright ball of light. This ball of light had emerged from the cemetery and proceeded to chase the stockman and his horse to the next station house. It was there that he told authorities about the encounter. And so because of this, because it came from right by the old Min Min Hotel, it, they, it got the name, of course, the Min Min Light. Since then, the light has chased many off. As the stockmen gave away to truckers, truckers soon found themselves being tormented by the strange light. Countless truckers had been chased by the Min Min over the years as they drive down Highway 62, which, is, which just goes right through the area. Often being scared out of their minds especially if it's their first time down 62, just outside of Bolia. And I'm going to link it in the show notes. If you have Amazon Prime, there is a series called Australian Skies, but it's spelled Australian, alien, get it? Uh, skies. And they've done like two or three of these. And you can watch the second one. The second one you can just watch. The other two you have to rent. I'm not sure why. But the second one is all about the Min Min Light. And uh, there is a great part in there of of a woman and her daughter are like, you know, they're trucking down, down 62 and they're just, you know, just scared to death of this thing behind their truck. And the daughter has the entire thing 
uh, recorded on her iPhone. You can like you don't really see them, but she's you know recording the back of the truck or holding out the window. I'm assuming, uh, and just has this light on camera. So it's one of the best parts. Check out that documentary. Uh, I'll link it in the show notes. Australian skies. I think Search of the Min Min is like its subtitle, but that was a big chunk of this, and it's a great watch. Not only does the Min Min like to chase, but there have been plenty who have decided to chase back. The problem is, they never seem to make much headway in catching up to the thing. Imagine running after this strange object at night in the middle of the desert and never catching it or even up to it. Now imagine giving up and realizing that you are now stranded out in the desert at night. Perhaps this is why uh, many say that if you chase the Min Min, you'll end up in tears. And a lot of people talk about how, you know, it's it's a deserty place and stuff like that is very hot during the day. But they also can get pretty cold at night. And I feel like if you don't know where you're at, you don't know what you're doing, you probably don't want to start chasing a mysterious light only to get stuck who knows where and now you're just out out against the elements. Doesn't sound like a fun time. There are, of course, uh, many ideas about what the light could be. Could the Min Min be caused by a piezoelectric effect, similar to that caused by quartz crystals? Is the light nothing more than insects that get covered by a bioluminescent agent in a certain fungi that grow around the area? I don't think that's what it is, but I like it. I like, I like. I think bugs covered in fungus that glow would be kind of neat. But I know I don't think that's what it is because like I said, it's like one light and it's very easy to tell that it is just one light, large light. It's not a bunch of glowing bugs that are flying maybe close enough together to assume, to make it look like they are a large light. Is it swamp gas? Of course. Why not? Or as uh, Dr. John Pettigrew suggests, is it a type of mirage known as a Feta Magorna. Feta Magorna occurs when light is bent as it goes through a specific atmospheric condition. When the weather conditions in the surrounding environment are just right, warm air may sit on top of cooler air and act as sort of a refracted lens. This type of mirage can shoot an image such as lights over uh, great distances also make objects such as ships appear to be floating in mid-air. The uh, Fata Morgana explanation does hold some water with uh, the area around where the Min Min are seen. In the winter around Bulia, when the conditions are just so, large hills that are 40 kilometers away appear much, much closer. If you didn't know any better, you would think that these hills are, say, 10 kilometers away. But if you watch them, if you sat and just observed them in the morning when they appear, you would sit there and you would watch them dissipate as the morning turned into the afternoon. Feta Morgana does explain a lot, but not every encounter fits. Some have observed the light below the horizon line. Uh, there have been a couple of people who have seen the light uh, in caves, or they've been in a cave and have seen it. So I don't think you're gonna get a reflect, you're gonna get that going on in a cave, right? And then there is the tale of Matthew Kuro. Kuro was a railway worker in 1997. One night at around 9 p.m., Kuro and two other men decided to drive around and check on some of the railroad. Kuro was in a truck with a fellow employee when they saw a bright light in the night sky. They followed this light down to a river and they watched as it crossed the river. Mirages uh, don't cross rivers. They turned off the light and the car, so the lights to the car and the car itself, and after disappearing for a couple of minutes, it came back at the truck crossing the river again. So now, now it's coming back at him. Matt decided to get out and have a look and got within 10 meters of the light. He then called the other worker over to their location, who also got a chance to observe it. And as soon as that guy joined the other two, uh, 
uh, he was done with it, and so was Matt's uh, buddy in the truck. Neither one of them wanted to hang around anymore. They were ready to be done with the Minmin light. Matt, Matt, not quite. You see, Matt noticed that the light didn't seem to like the noise and the light coming from the truck. So he decided to take a walk up to the railway bridge and uh, just find some peace and quiet. The light soon appeared in front of him. Hiro followed it for a while, trying to touch it. He could just reach out, but the light was able to stay just out of reach. Eventually, the light dulled in color and just shot off at tremendous speed down the railway. Over the years, Bulia has embraced the Min Min. In 2000, they opened the Min Min Encounter Center, which is a museum slash attraction to educate people on the history and the folklore of the Min Min Light. Many of the points of interest, such as the Unknown Traveler's Grave and, uh, and other stuff like that, are uh, adorned with informational signs, almost like a park, like, you know, when you go into some parks and you pass, like, you know, the ruins of someone's house that lived, you know, back when the park was just land and there's a placard saying that or whatever. That's what those are very much like. I think I might have a picture of, not of one, but if you look in the picture, you will see it. So the Minmin light, it's still out there today. And uh, we're still not quite sure what it is. Let's move on to uh, the Hesdalen lights, and then I'm going to come back around and kind of talk about them both together. I have some thoughts, if you will. Uh, the village of Hesdalen in Norway is located in the Hesdalen Valley. The village has a population of about 200 people. Like Bully Australia, it's an out of the way place, and very much like Bully, people have been seeing mysterious lights there for uh, close to a hundred years. You'll find tales about the light here and there going back about a century or so, but in the 40s, the story started gaining more and more ground. Then, in 1981, the sky seemed to literally explode in bright balls of mysterious light. These light shows could happen up to 20 times a week, and this huge surge of activity lasted until 1984, 1985, when suddenly the activity decreased. The light shows did and do continue, but now only show themselves uh, maybe a couple dozen times a year. Unlike the Min Min, the Hesdalen lights have been studied by science for decades. In 1983, Dr. Erling Strand started Project Hesdalen. The project has since been embraced by many scientists and many scientific publications, making it one of the largest interests ever taken by science for an unexplained phenomenon. The project has done everything from seismograph readings to uh, spectrum analysis to prove that what's going on has Dolan is uh, not just some reflected headlights. You can visit the Project Has Dolan website for like all of their reports, pictures, I mean pictures of like this year. So they, they still post up. And uh, even some live cams. I need to talk about this website a little bit though. Uh, it is an archaic website. Like I said, it's still updated. Uh, it's updated with new information and new pictures, but uh, it is not a modern webpage in the least. And I don't think the live cams work anymore. Uh, I tried to click on one, cause you'll get one that's a link that's like, Watch the live cam on your iPad. It's very specific to on your iPad. I didn't do that on my iPad. I clicked on my Mac. And so I had I had all this loaded up on a 4K monitor. And for a little bit, I got I got the live cam, but on my monitor, it was probably a quarter of an inch high by like half an inch. And it was only on there for a few seconds. And uh, then it died. And I got like like the play, you know, the play symbol with the with a, with a no through it, with a no sign through it. So that didn't work, but I have linked in the show notes, windy.com or something like that, 
which is a collection of weather cams like all over the world. And there are two or three of them pointed around his Dolan. And you can watch, they're not live, they're like time lapsed every day and every month. But you can check those out every once in a while and maybe catch catch a light. That'd be kind of neat on, on one of these weather cams. Yeah, it's an archaic but functional website. And when you really start clicking on stuff, you will find so much, just very technical, very scientific, but so much information on this phenomenon. And a lot of that information is due to the blue box. In 1994, a group of students started a project of their own. And then it was kind of taken in by the Hesdolan project. They began construction of a 10 by 10 steel container in blue. Inside are various instruments and equipment, measuring things such as weather conditions, detecting optical and uh, radiomagnetic radiation, uh, pictures and videos, this is where all their pictures come from, electromagnetic radiation, and it's even part of the Global Consciousness Project with its own number generator. And I don't remember if I've mentioned the Global Conscious Project before. I feel like I have, but I'll reiterate. It is uh, just like a group of random number generators placed all over the world that try to predict when uh, certain things are going to happen. They've noticed that, for example, like during 9-11, this is the big one, that they always use that the random number generators on that day seem to be way more predictable and they are... Uh, saying this is that happened because of the emotional state of people on that day that emotional energy was so much the consciousness was so powerful that it, it was affecting the random number generators and making them much more easy to predict what numbers were going to pop up and uh, it's been an ongoing project for years and so uh, this uh, this little research station in Hannes Dolan is part of that project the little station's name is uh, the official name is the Hasdolan AMS, the Automatic Measurement Station. It's lovingly referred to though as the Blue Box, because it does just look like a, it's a little blue shipping container, basically. Many of the same theories abound around the Hasdolan lights are the same as the one for the Min Min. Is it the piezoelectric effect? Various gases, there's that swamp gas again. Uh, reflections of headlights. And this one is much more plausible because even though it's secluded, it's not like Australia secluded, like there's still traffic flow around it to an extent. And then there are some other some other ideas. Like I said, a lot of research has been done here. So they, there's a lot of speculation as to what's going on. Perhaps, just perhaps, it's a large deposits of a rare element known as scandium. Scandium for some reason has a tendency to combust when it's paired with oxygen, sodium, and or hydrogen. And that's like a rare, it's called Scandium because I think the only place, it's only found like in the Scandinavian part of the world. The lights may be caused by a relationship between plasma reacting with the radioactive elements in the area. A new theory suggests that metallic minerals deep underground are reacting to a sulfurous river that runs through said materials, uh, creating sort of a natural battery, quote unquote. And I've linked, there's a whole article about that, and that'll be in the show notes, and I've got a little picture here that illustrates it as well. It's kind of an interesting one to look into. Or, are they UFOs? Many seem to think so. Even the late J. Allen Hynek spent some of the last years of his life in Norway researching the Hesdalen Lights. And uh, if you're not familiar with who J.M. Hynek was, he was kind of the main scientist that was uh, partnered with Blue Book. It was kind of him and Jacques Vallée, Project Blue Book. But, you know, in the 80s, there's some, you can find great little video clips of him just uh, bundled up in this huge coat, you know, fur around his head, big old beard, snowing, and he's just talking about his little lights and how excited he is to be there. Uh, I can't find that entire video. I can only find like 10 seconds here and 15 seconds there. But there, it is out there. You can find it. And it's a fun little thing to watch. 
Whatever they are, they seem to keep to the skies. There have been thousands of sightings of the lights, but nothing one would call encounters. The lights have never interacted with anyone, unlike the Minmin light. The Hesdalen lights do not seem to have a mind of their own. The Hesdalen lights fall into the category of, if not paranormal, it's still pretty damn interesting, at least to me. They provide a mystery that has people camping in the hills around Heslin for more than 40 years, and probably will for some time to come. Uh, like, I think, so this is kind of where I'm at with both of these. I feel like the Heslin lights are going to turn out to be something very grounded in reality. They're going to be a, a natural battery or something like that. They're going to turn out to be something I don't think paranormal, but something very interesting. Or, I, I mean, I could be completely wrong. Not a scientist. Uh, and I think the Min Min, I think there's something much more esoteric about the Min Min light. Uh, I think some of what people see in Min Min is this whole Theta Morganic mirage, but not all of it. Like... Like I said, so it's called the, they call it the Min Min Light. Uh, if you're really cool in Australia, you just call it the Min Min. Like you don't even put light on the end of it. So it's not lights, it's light. When people see the Min Min Light, the actual one, they are seeing one solitary light, at least as far as I can tell. So what is that a reflection of? Is it a reflection of like a motorcycle headlight? If so, are there enough motorcycles driving down this desolate stretch of road at night? The thing only shows up at night. It doesn't show up during the day. At night, uh, I don't know. You know, it, it, I'm going to go back to that documentary. The first, they camp out there for a couple of nights while doing stuff. And uh, that first night, man, they're like, oh, there it is. We see it. Uh, and they very quickly suss out that they are seeing headlights in the distance because they're seeing two of them. But, like I said, it's one light. It is a light. Which, back in the day, the effect, the Fata Morgana effect, could have been chalked up to just simply being a campfire out there. Like, that's how sensitive this place can be. This this uh, phenomenon can be. So I feel like if you see the Min Min light, if you see one, I think you're seeing the Min Min light. If you see two, more, I think you're seeing some sort of mirage. Um... Yeah, it's kind of, I think, you know, I think that could be, depending on where you're at, chalked up to both, both of those explanations. And then, uh, also in that documentary, Pettigrew tries to say, like, hey, I tried to tell these Hesdolan guys, like, yo, it's, it's this mirage effect. And they're like, no, it's not. And I, I, I'm keen to agree. So I have, here's my soapbox on this. Once again, not a scientist. Everything I'm about to say could be complete bunk. But look at pictures of the Fata Morgana effect. And a lot of them, a lot of the common ones are, are ships or boats that appear, because of the uh, effect, that they are floating above the water. So I will paint you a picture of a picture with the word. You will have, like, you know, the water, the ocean floor, and then you will have the kind of reflected lens effect which will be like a distorted blue band because it's reflecting the sky, right? But there will be, there won't be anything in that band. Like it'll just it'll look blue, but if you look at it and squint, you can see that it's a little distorted, it's a little off. And so that band is then kind of covering the bottom of this ship, and that's why the ship where it's pushing up that blue light in front of the ship, and that's why the ship looks like it's floating because you can't see the bottom of it. Uh, they show, like when I talked about those hills, in that dock, they show those hills. And it's the same thing. You don't see the bottom of the hills. You see, like, a blue band of blue sky kind of, you know, pushed up in front of it, so it's covering that. So what I'm getting at, though, is, like, you don't see stuff in this blue band. You don't see clouds or anything. But when you look at pictures, like, I mean... Not hard to find them. Like, just get YouTube and Google Hesdalen Lights. Like, you'll find plenty of video, you know. And uh, you'll notice very quickly that, like, not, not, I don't think, not a lot of them do that. Like, you will see, even if there was, like, a reflection, 
you'll see, you won't see that weird band. You'll see you'll see clouds above and below the lights. You'll see trees on a tree line, which with that with that effect, if I'm think, looking at enough pictures of it, uh, would be covered up by said reflection. So I'm not sure if the Hesdalen lights are the Fata Morgana. Maybe a few of them are, but once again, it's in a valley. Uh, I believe for that to really work, it's got to be a nice flat surface. So that's why it works so well, like out in the desert, and out in the outback, because it's just flat and there's nothing, there's no trees. It's just flat brown dirt and beautiful red brown dirt, but dirt nonetheless. And and then it works very well, of course, on the ocean because that is also just a flat nothingness to get in the way. But like in Norway. There's trees everywhere. We are in a, like I said, we are in the Hesdalen Valley. So we, there are hills. It's not a flat place. So I don't know if the Fata Morgana effect works for the Hesdalen lights. Uh, I said a lot of things there. It might have been a bit babbly. I hope that made a little bit of sense. So I think, I think that's where we're going to see. I, I think one of these days, Hesdalen will give us some really cool scientific answer to what's going on and Min Min will just become this is weird a spook, spook, spook light a paranormal light that uh, will defy explanation for a little bit. I also think as far as Min Min light goes I think it would be very interesting to uh, run an experiment with traffic. Get out there, camp out for a little bit at the Min Min Hotel ruins uh, get some of those things that they put along the road to measure traffic like you run over it and it counts. Like it's just a little wire or a little piece of cable. It counts when something runs over it how much traffic it is. And literally just, if those mountains show up 40 kilometers away, go out like 50 kilometers away or whatever. And every 10 kilometers, put, put something that can measure the traffic and just keep an eye on it. And be like, all right, we see two lights. We just had a car run over one of our, you know, one of our monitors at 50 k's away. Well, now it's at 30, you know, like, and and see if there's a correlation. And if you start seeing one light and no one's running over your traffic monitor, well, you know where I'm going with this. I think that would be an interesting experiment uh, that someone should do in Australia. I can't do it. But that's it. That's kind of all my thoughts. That's what we have about the Min Min lights and the Hesdolan lights. I'm going to take a break here to the intermission. We're going to uh, play uh, the song Lights in the Sky. Seems appropriate. And then I'll be back with the local headlines, everybody.
big theme today in uh, or on this episode uh, for the news, because I'm just going to talk about monoliths for all three news stories, because they just won't go away. Actually, I guess those are the news stories, is that they are going away, but in, in very, very interesting ways. First one, from the New York Times, written by Sergei Kovleski, Deborah Solomon, and Zoe Rosenberg, is uh, how a mysterious monolith vanished overnight. It wasn't aliens. It was, by most standards, a short stay. The pop-up metal monolith that became the focus of international attention after it was spotted in a remote section of the Utah desert on November 18th. It was dismantled 10 days later. On Tuesday, a local outdoorsman with a penchant for stunts claimed credit on social media for the sculpture's removal. The office of San Juan County Sheriff at first announced that it was declining to investigate the case in the absence of complaints about missing property. To underscore the point, it uploaded a Most Wanted poster on its website, or rather a jockey version of one in which the face of the suspects replaced by nine big-eyed aliens. But by the end of Monday, the sheriff's office had reversed its position and announced that it was planning a joint investigation with the Bureau of Land Management, a federal agency. It was left to an adventure photographer, Ross Bernards, to disclose evidence on Instagram. Mr. Bernards, 34, of Edwards, Colorado, was visiting the monolith on Friday night when, he said, Four men arrived as if out of nowhere to dismantle the sculpture. Mr. Bernard had driven six hours for a chance to oogle the sculpture and take dramatic photographs of it using upscale loom cube lights attached to a drone. He produced a series of glowy, moonlit pictures in which the monolith glistens against the red cliffs and the deep blue sky of the deep blue night sky. And suddenly, around 8.40 p.m., he said the men arrived, their voices echoing in the canyon, working in twosomes with an unmistakable sense of purpose. They gave the monolith hard shoves and it started to tilt toward the ground. Then they pushed it in the opposite direction, trying to uproot it. This is why you don't leave trash in the desert, one of them said, suggesting that he viewed the monolith as an eyesore, a pollutant to the landscape, according to Mr. Bernard's. The sculpture popped out and landed on the ground with a bang. Then, the men broke it apart and ferried it off in a wheelbarrow. As they walked off with the pieces, one of them said, Leave no trace, Mr. Bernard recalled in a telephone interview. He did not photograph the men who took down the sculpture, saying he didn't want to start a confrontation by bringing out my camera and putting it in their face, especially since I agreed with them what they were doing. But a friend who accompanied him on the trip, Michael James Newlands, 38, of Denver, took a few quick, quick photographs with his cell phone. It must have been 10 or 15 minutes at most for them to knock over the monolith and pull it out, he told the New York Times. We didn't know who they were, and we were not going to uh, do anything to stop them, he added. They just came in there to execute, and they were like, this is our mission. The, photo the photos are blurry, but they fascinate nonetheless. Here are the images of several men working beneath the cover of darkness, wearing gloves, but not face masks, standing above the fallen monolith. We can see it's exposed inside. It turns out that it's a hollow structure with a, an armature made from plywood. The photographs are the only known image of the culprits who removed the sculpture. They may have been the same people who installed it in the first place. They may not, I'm sorry. They may not have been the same people who installed it in the first place. On Tuesday, Andy L. Lewis, a professional sportsman in nearby Moab, Utah, a place I very much want to go, took credit for the sculpture's removal with his group, posting a video on his Facebook page. Mr. Lewis, a 34-year-old uh, slackline performer who specializes in high-altitude stunts and brought his uh, sport to Madonna's 2012 uh, Super Bowl halftime show, his video consists of a short, shadowy clip, barely half a minute long, that shows the monolith laying in a wheelbarrow as someone quickly rolls it out of the park. The safe word is run, one man says, as his headlamp illuminates the fallen sculpture. His friend, Sylvan Christensen, who said he had taken part in dismantling the sculpture, sent the statement to the New York Times on Tuesday, 
evening explaining that the group took it upon themselves to destroy the sculpture to protect the area, not only from the incursion of the silvery sculpture, but also from gawkers who had begun descending to see it. Lynn wasn't physically prepared for uh, the pollution shift, they wrote, adding that the public needs to be educated about proper land use and management. But Mr. Lewis has not always been so supportive of the challenges faced by the Bureau of Land Management. He pleaded guilty in federal court in Utah in 2014 to uh, lying to rangers at Arches National Park, a place I was going to visit, and then uh, just never made it there. He was accused of hindering their investigation into base jumping, a sport that Mr. Lewis practices. At the time, the Bureau of Land Management was trying to prohibit such aerial sports, which can damage the homes of owls, bighorn sheep, and other animals that inhabit the desert. Mr. Lewis was fined $965 and uh, was put on 18 months probation, during which time he has profited, he was prohibited, I'm sorry, from entering a national park. Asked if they were focusing on any suspects, Alan Freestone, chief deputy with the San Juan County Sheriff's Office, said on Tuesday, I know they have some leads, and that's all I'm going to say right now. Artists have been casually speculating that whomever put up the sculpture had probably taken it down uh, once it was discovered. As if aspiring to be an anonymous artist, activist, uh, the, Banksy of the, the Banksy of the desert. But art world speculation has not yielded too many facts. Initially, the monolith was linked to John McCracken, a California-born artist who died in 2011 and harbored a taste for science fiction. David Zwerner, the New York art dealer who represents the artist's estate, had at first identified the monolith as an authentic McCracken, stepped forward on Monday to tell the Times that he had studied photographs of it and no longer had any idea who made it. Alheim Reach, who represents the artist at her galleries in Paris and Brussels, also contacted a reporter denying that the desert monolith was a McCracken. All of this leaves us no way out of closer to solving the mystery of who entered or who created, I'm sorry, the Utah sculpture. On the plus side, the monolith that captivated the country over the past week, then disappeared as quickly as it entered public consciousness, continues to provide a pleasant sensation of uncertainty. Would it lose the ore of power if we knew who had created it? That's some magical thinking right there from the New York Times. The next one is uh, also from the New York Times. Written Is it written by the same people? No, written by uh, Sarah Bear. And this one says, California monolith is removed and replaced with a cross. A group of young men chanting Christ is King drove five hours to dismantle the third shiny metal sculpture to mysteriously appear in the last few weeks, leaving a wooden cross in its place. How the third monolith to crop up in the past month arrived atop Pine Mountain in Atascadero, California, where it was discovered by a hiker on Wednesday, remains a mystery. How it left is no secret. Several young men who officials said apparently driven five hours from Southern California live streamed themselves tearing out the shiny three-sided steel structure in a stadium park early Thursday morning, and then leaving a plywood cross behind in its place. Christ is King, the men wearing night vision goggles and camo gear, chanted as the grainy video as they toppled the shiny structure in a video that was posted to the streaming site dlive.tv by someone using the name Culture War Criminal, but later removed according to the San Luis Obispo Tribune. The Tribune described the video as, at times racist, and homophobic, and said that the men sing along to country songs. One of the men said in the video that they had removed the structure to tell the alien overlords they are not welcome, according to the Tribune. Another claim they were operating on direct orders of QAnon and President Trump himself, referring to the conspiracy theory that falsely claims that Mr. Trump is being undermined by a group of Democratic pedophiles. More than 600 people were watching at one point according to the paper. A second video posted shortly after the first show the men dragging the monolith down the hill while shouting America first and referring to themselves as military veterans, according to the paper. The California monolith has been the third shiny metal sculpture to crop up in the past month. The first sculpture, which captured wide attention, was discovered in a remote section of the Utah desert on November 18th and was initially to believe that of the work of minimalist sculptor John McCracken, or Aliens. Four men dismantled the Utah Curiosity a 
that had captured the country just 10 days after it arrived, but not before it appeared to spawn copycats. A second sculpture popped up in the mountains of Romania on November 26, shortly before the disappearance of the one in Utah. But the Romanian monolith was ha uh, also vanished on Tuesday, uh, the Reuters new agency reported from Bucharest. Like the structure in Romania, the California structure appears to be a copycat of the original in Utah. It stood about 10 feet tall and weighed an estimated 200 pounds, according to the city of Atlas Cadero. While the Utah structure was firmly mounted, the Atlas Cadero news reported that the California monolith was a little wobbly and it seemed that it would be uh, possible to push it over. Atlas Cadero officers have previously marveled at the monolith's arrival. Terry Banish, deputy city manager of the small town of around 30,000 people on the central California coast, said in the interview on Thursday morning that whatever had installed it would have had to hike up the site, which had an elevation of about 1,300 feet and is approximately two miles from the nearest parking lot. On Thursday afternoon, the city officials lamented its removal. We were upset that these young men felt the need to drive five hours to come into our community and vandalize the monolith. The mayor of Atlas Cadero, Heather Moreno, said in a release, the monolith is something unique and fun in an otherwise stressful time. The city's police department remained unsure who installed the monolith and was reviewing the video and looking into the incident further, according to the release. And I was kind of wondering, now I'm not so sure, now that I kind of think about it, but like, I was, I was like, what if they're the same? Like, what if the California one is just the Utah one that these guys took out? And then like stuck it in California, and uh, and then they gets vandalized a few days later. Uh, I don't know. Maybe it wouldn't be that hard to get one from Utah to California. You can you can drive there in a day. I've done it. So I don't know. I don't know. Are they the same or is it just a copycat? Uh, but I didn't mention one in Romania. And so here is the story from the Daily Mail about the Romania one. And this is written by uh, Rachel Bunyan for the Mail Online. Uh, now a mysterious Arthur C. Clarke style monolith appears in Romania after unexplained metal version vanished from Utah. So who or what put it there? A mysterious metal monolith had appeared in Russia, has appeared in Russia this week after another similar structure found in the remote Utah desert was removed by an unknown party. The shiny triangular pillar was found on Bacta Domai Hill in the city of Pytra, Niemet, in northern Romania last Thursday. It was spotted a few meters away from a well-known archaeological landmark, the Perdova Dacian Fortress, a fort built by the ancient Dacian people between 80 BC and AD 106. 82 BC, I'm sorry, and AD 106. The peculiar find comes after a similar monolith was found in the Utah desert with no explanation sparking wry speculation that it could have been the work of aliens, but is more likely the work of a prankster inspired by science fiction novel 2001 A Space Odyssey. And we're back to that. In the book by Arthur C. Clarke, later made into a film by Stanley Kubrick, a monolith first appears on Earth in Africa three million years ago and appears to confer intelligence upon a starving tribe of great apes to develop tools. The monolith is a is a tool used by an alien race to investigate worlds across the galaxy and to encourage the development of intelligent life. In the book, the great apes use their tools to kill animals, to eat meat, to end their starvation, and to kill a predatory leopard. Next day, the main character uses a club to kill the leader of a rival tribe of apes, leading to an awakening of intelligence and the development of humans. In Utah, the pillar, which protruded approximately 12 feet from the Red Rocks in southern Utah, was spotted last Wednesday by a baffled local BLM officials who were counting bighorn sheep from a helicopter. However, the three-sided structure was removed by an unknown party on Friday evening, the Bureau of Land Management in Utah said in a statement. Uh, said in a statement. News of the stubborn Utah, Utah quickly went viral online, with many noting the object's similarity to the strange alien monoliths that triggered a huge leap in human progress in Kubrick's classic sci-fi film, 2001 A Space Odyssey. In Romania, the triangular sculpture has a height of about 13 feet, and one side faces Mount, I'm gonna say this wrong, Mount Kilau, known locally as the Holy Mountain. It is one of the most famous mountains in Romania, and is listed as one of the several natural wonders 
of the country. Romanian officials still do not know who is responsible for erecting the mysterious monument. The Met Culture and Heritage official Rosanna Johnsau, Johnsau said, We have started looking into the strange appearance of the monolith. It's on private property, but we still don't know who the monolith's owner is yet. It is, a, it is in a protected area on an archaeological site. She added, Before installing something there, they needed permission from our institution, one that must have been approved by the Ministry of Culture. The Utah monolith provoked arguments about tourists who drove huge distances to see the monolith and were accused of trashing the location, which authorities had tried to keep secret to avoid people getting lost. But many tracked down the coordinates and published them, leading people to drive many hours through the night to reach the 12-foot aluminum structure. And it was revealed that a similar version appeared nearly 20 years ago on New Year's Day in Seattle. However, access to the site involved a 45-minute off-road drive on a dirt track many miles from any major town at 10 miles an hour and a 15-minute hike up a dry stream bed. Across the globe, UFO spotters and conspiracy theorists became obsessed with the shiny triangular pillar. Though the structure was only discovered by authorities this month, Google Earth images show that it had been standing since at least 2015 or 2016. Lieutenant Nick Street, a spokesman for the Department of Public Fa Safety, said it's possible the structure had been there for uh, 40, 50 years, maybe. It's the type of material that doesn't degrade with the elements, and it may only be a few years old. Who knows? There's no real way, based on the material it's made out of, to know how long it's actually been there, he said on Tuesday. Others point out the project's resemblance to the avant-garde work of John McCracken, an American artist who lived for a time in nearby New Mexico and died in 2011. McCracken was known for his freestanding sculptures in the shape of pyramids, cubes, or sleek slabs. The monolith most closely resembles McCracken's plant-like sculptures featured at his exhibit at the David Zwerner Art Gallery in New York. On Tuesday, a spokesman for the David Zwerner said that it's not one of McCracken's works, but possibly by a fellow artist paying homage. However, later in the day, Zwerner gave another statement which suggests that the piece was indeed by McCracken, meaning it had lain undiscovered in the desert for nearly a decade. The gallery is, is divided on this, Zwerner said. I believe that this is definitely by John. Utah has a history of land art, usual uh, unusual installations that cropped up far from the population centers in the 1960s and 70s. The most famous spiral jetty, a 1,500-foot-long coil by artist Robert Smithen in the 1970s that can impose entirely of mud, salt crystals, and basalt. Located on the northern edge of the Great Salt Lake near Roswell Point, the jetty appears and disappears depending on the water levels. So far, no one has stepped forward to claim responsibility for the monolith, though. So there you go, the extensive uh, story of the monoliths up to this point. And I'm sure they are just an art installation by somebody. I don't think aliens would make their monoliths out of plywood and aluminum. I'd hope not. I'd hope they'd be made out of something much more interesting than those two materials. But, and that's all it is. But the thing about it, the thing that captures my imagination about it is that I've kind of said, I don't know if I've said on the show, but we've been through a lot of shit this year and i feel like in some ways it's not not an awakening but i feel like 2020 really has been like forcing us to look a little more at what is going on and uh and make some changes and do some things differently or else i don't know and uh when you compare these monoliths to their significance in 2001, it makes a lot of sense. And it also makes a lot of sense as why they are popping up now. Like, they are meant to represent a leap in human evolution. And we've been through this year where we are, it seems like nature and everything is kind of screaming at us to evolve a little bit. And uh, now we have these monoliths that are also kind of saying, hey, it's time to kind of step up to the plate, uh, change some things, maybe go in a little bit different direction, see how that works. I, I won't get on my soapbox about 2020, but I guess I could, I could have almost done a whole episode on just the monoliths. A lot of information there I know. I'll link these in the articles in the show notes so you can take a look. Uh, pictures of everything going on. Uh, weird stuff, interesting stuff. Rather, they are made by... Uh, 
uh, aliens who really dig aluminum and wood or just uh, made by someone back in the 70s. It's still, still pretty cool to think about. So after the boom, I've got uh, just one tonight, uh, one small town secret to share, uh, and then we'll uh, finish up the show. Uh, so yeah, just one tonight. Uh, the well is running dry. So if you have an experience you want to share, uh, please get it to me. Usually I do this at the end of the show, but I'm going to do it now. <laughs> I have a lot of ways that you can do it. Go to stscast.com. At the bottom of the main page is an email form. And you can send me your Bigfoot experience, your UFO story, your local ghost legend, uh, your local haunted house, your true crime story that everyone talks about. Whenever you get together and get a few beers in you, whatever it is, I want to hear about it. I want to put it on the show. You can send me an article. You can type something up. You can, uh, we can get on Skype or whatever and do it that way. Uh, you can record your own thing and I can just throw it in, throw it into the show. But yeah, if you have one you want to share, that's the easiest way to do it. Uh, you can also go to my social medias. I'll do those at the end of the show and uh, get to me that way. But yeah, I need. I need stories, people. I need stuff. Do have some interviews, getting those lined up. So hopefully next couple of episodes we'll have some pretty cool interviews coming up. I keep hinting at them, but they will happen. But I've got one here from Reddit from a username Falzerar. And when you're when you see something that kind of starts with uh, the headline is basically or the title is basically so I was digging in a graveyard. You've got to do it right. So this is his uh, experience about digging in a graveyard. It was a few years back, but I want to share the experience. Uh, first, I am not a grave robber, nor a pervert, but I was a construction worker back then, and we had to replace an old connector water pipe from a great church in our city with a new one. Around the church was a lot of green lawn, which, as we were about to learn, was used as a graveyard for the richer citizens from 1100 up to the 1800s. The thing is, the ground there is very clay. That's a very, probably pretty hard to dig through, which brings uh, the dissolving of human skeletons to a hole. This, mixed with the old grave digging habits from people back then, led to our excavator digging out lots and lots of human bones. As soon as it got deeper than one meter, it was pretty awkward, as the whole construction team was just standing there, sta staring while the excavator unearthed whole skeletons and then cut them in half because in real life the bones aren't still connected like they are in cartoons and such. I, as the trainee back then, got the job to pick the bones from the earth pile the excavator created. Uh, while my three co-workers just stood there refusing to touch anything. I stood there wearing gloves, taking up bones and like a complete skull, brushing them more or less, uh, cleaning and collecting them on a piece of cardboard until the archaeologists showed up on the site. They took photos, told us some of the facts of when this place was a graveyard, before taking off again. After the work was done, we threw everything back in before the holes got filled up. The paranormal about this was uh, that as soon as I started working at the bones, I felt like being watched, not only by my colleagues, but also by the dead. Not necessarily the ones I was holding in my hands, though. At some point, I was even able to see them, but only from the corner of my eyes. I was uh, around paranormal things since forever. I saw two people standing right next to the hole watching as I did my thing, but they disappeared as soon as I turned my head. At first, they seemed to be upset, gestures. I didn't hear them, but as they noticed I was very careful and respectful with the remnants, they stood there watching me. After that, they disappeared, but I saw them again. They reappeared in the same style on the always free back seats of our car as we headed back to the department. I was the only one seeing them, but my coworkers were a little bit creeped out by the fact that I had touched human bones without hesitating. Uh, the phenomenon stopped after I prayed for their souls later on. It was a fun job and not the only weird experience. So uh, once again, just he could have just talked about digging up bones in a graveyard and that would have been enough and then he sticks the the uh, being watched by 
things unknown, things behind the veil at the end of it. So that's what really took that story. Thanks for letting me use it. And uh, that's it. That is uh, your small town secrets for this episode. And there we go. Episode three, season five in the bag. It is donezo. Uh, yes. Like I said, please go to stscast.com. If you have an experience to share other things on that website, everything's on that website. Merch is on that website. Um, Patreon links are on that website. Episode notes, pictures are on that website. Actually, I have to, I have to sit down and update. I forgot to update it last episode, so now I will have to update uh, two episodes tomorrow. But I'll get there. All of that is on there. Uh, you know, all the ways that you can find the show are on there. Social media links are on there. Speaking of social media, if you would like to engage with me on social media, uh, I'm most active on Twitter. That is at stscast.com. Facebook is also at stscast. Instagram is uh, at stscast.gram. That's the weird one. That's the one that's always different. And that's where I'm at. That's where you can find me. Please, if uh, you can, leave a rating and review on your podcatcher of choice, especially iTunes. That's the one that helps out the most. That's the one that gets us most noticed and helps it float to the top. And like I say all the time, if you enjoy the show, uh, get someone else to listen to the show. Everyone out there gets one more person to listen, then the audience automatically doubles. So thank you for doing that. Thanks for supporting. Thanks for listening. And uh, I'm going to get off here and get this one uploaded, uh, eat some pizza that I probably shouldn't eat, and then uh, fall asleep, and then get up tomorrow and update everything. So that's the rest of my weekend. I, do something fun. Don't do that horse shit. Do something fun. So until next time, remember, every town has a secret. What is yours?